<laughs> Harry Krishna, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition or episode of the Harry Krishna Project podcast. This is episode number 102. I cannot believe that we've made it to 102 episodes. A big thank you to everyone who's continued to tune in on a weekly basis to hear from our guest, not to hear from me, but to hear from our guest, wherever he or she is from all around the world. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our guest this, this week. It's His Holiness Bhakti Nandan Swami Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, it's great to have you with us. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu, it's also my special pleasure to be in this meeting with your good self and also through this Hare Krishna project with all the good hearted devotees. My loving regards to your good self and all the good hearted devotee audience. Hare Krishna. Jai Guranga. And this is a very special, well, every podcast is very special, but I feel really humbled about this episode because some of you um, who know a bit about kind of Gaudiya history or Gaudiya Vaishnav history might recognize where Maharaj is for this recording. He's sitting, sitting in a very holy, auspicious place. He's sitting in the Bhajan Kutir, Bhajan Kutar of Srila Bhakti Rakshak Shidar Dev Goswami Maharaj. And many of the photos, the famous photos that, that, that we've seen of Srila Shridhar Maharaj have been of him sitting in that seat, that very special sanctuary, the seat which Srila Bhakti Nandan Swami Maharaj is actually sitting next to right now. And we know that Srila Shridhar Maharaj had lots of wonderful spiritual discourses with his god brothers, with his disciples, and in particular with A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada in that very location, in that very holy um, spiritual Bhajan Kutir. So I feel really overwhelmed that you're in that location to record that podcast. What a what a place. And I think of mostly all the photos I've seen of Srila Shuddha Maharaj, they've been of, of him, of Maharaj, in that location, mm. which is phenomenal. So thank you for recording the podcast from that location um, today. Okay. Um, so Maharaj and I actually met uh, in this life for the first time last August, uh, I think Maharaj was on a speaking yeah, tour of the UK, and we met in a wonderful town called Slough, uh, <laughs> which is just outside of London, and Maharaj came to talk to devotees and meet devotees, and I was invited along to, to meet him, which is um, how we've set up this podcast today. So let's get started with the questions. Um, Maharaj, the first question is a nice, easy question that I ask every guest Please tell us a bit about you and where you are from. Hare Krishna. So briefly, I have been born and practically brought up in Sinabuddhi Dham, the holy birthplace, very auspicious divine birthplace of Lord Chaitanya. So Fortunately, I was born in a devotee's family. The devotees who were initiated by my Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Rakshak Siddhar Deva Goswami Maharaj. See, my parents, my grandparents of both sides, Maternal grandparents and paternal grandparents were all in his Bhakti Rakshak, Siddhartha Deva Goswami Pad. So I had that special fortune of being born in that devotee's family. My mother already got initiated by Sila Siddhartha Deva Goswami Maharaj even before her marriage, okay, then my 
my biological father also got initiated later on mm, after uh, his marriage with my mother. But uh, also my maternal grandparents, paternal grandparents. So having this fortunate chance, naturally I came in contact with Srila Guru Maharaj, I mean, Srila Bhakti Rakshak, Siddhar Deva Goswami Maharajji, and his mission from my babyhood, not just my childhood, from my babyhood, when I did not know anything, I heard naturally, because since my parents were uh, disciples of Srila Guru Maharaj, so naturally, after birth, I mean, they used to be visiting uh, <clears throat> uh, Sila Guru Maharaj's place. In other words, my parents becoming as the disciples of Sila Guru Maharaj Ji. So naturally, they used to come to have darshan of their Guru Devo and his temple. So while coming over here to be visiting their Gurudev, naturally they used to bring me also along with. I heard from my mother that maybe a month later or so, or maybe even lesser than that, after like around... Hmm, after 20 days after my birth, she came to have darshan of my Guru Maharaj and placed her baby okay, before the lotus feet of Sila Guru Maharaj. And after touching the lotus feet, holy feet of Guru Maharaj, my mother also touched over my head, like, uh, like taking the blessings of the holy feet of her guru, Sila Bhakti Rakshak, Sila Deva Goswami Maharaj, and rubbing on my head and on her baby's body, like taking the blessings from the lotus feet and blessing her baby. That was the Vedic traditional way. And that's what I heard from my mother. But I did not remember anything I heard. Uh, from my mother. Also, I heard about that from Simati Krishnamoyi Devi, one of the foremost um, prince, principal disciples, very prominent disciple of Sila Bhakti Rakshak, Siddhara Deva Goswami Maharaj. So, <laughs> back to the point. Okay. So, being, I mean, because of having the facilities of being born in a devotee's family, Krishna devotee's family. So I had that fortunate chance of coming in contact with my beloved divine master, beloved divine garden, my Guru Maharaj, even in my babyhood, when I did not remember anything. So I received, that was the, my first the starting point of receiving the blessings from the holy feet of my Guru Maharaj. At that time, he was not yet officially my Guru Maharaj, but, okay, would be, would be, my would be Guru Maharaj at that time, but he was already Guru Maharaj to my parents, okay, to my mother. So, so then <clears throat> I heard that because I was born in Navadip Dham, in a hospital in Navadip Dham, maybe one kilometer, uh, one, one to two kilometers, maybe I'm not sure, around two kilometers far from Chaitanya Sarasvatma situation. 
so then when my mother came with her baby means me then Srila Guru Maharaj sent a deity's garland to welcome that newborn baby which was this loving servitor myself um, he sent a deity's garland okay and to put that garland around me so as prashadam okay so all the credit of my such i say all the real credit of such my fortune actually goes to the divine grace divine mercy of sila guru maharaj and their lordships shri radha madan mohan govind gopinath mahaprabhu but since you have asked me a question about me so something to talk about me i thought i should start from the beginning starting point so so naturally from my babyhood i started living inside the area of sri chaitanya sharashat mark sri guru maharaj's own temple because my mother's father's house sorry my mother's parents house was situated right inside the area okay inside the area close to the compound somewhat close to the compound wall of navadip sri chaitanya sharashat mat because my mother's parents were one of the chosen devotees families sila guru maharaj disciple families whom sila guru maharaj wanted to settle around okay inside chaitanya sharashat mat so that he could receive some sarv his help from his own disciples in the in the form of my maternal grandparents so so he the guru maharaj ordered them to settle okay around chaitanya sarashat mat inside chaitanya sarashat mat so following okay so following and honoring the desire of their gurudev my maternal grandparents okay got situated okay got settled uh within the area of chaitanya sarashat mat okay so that they could serve their gurudev whenever they were required to assist him okay in this service to mahaprabhu radha govind sundar so they were so glad to have received that fortune that their gurudev desired ordered them to settle down around chaitanya sarashat mat area so that whenever sila guru maharaj required any help any specific service from them they could offer that to their gurudev to their gurudev's mission so in this way my maternal grandparents got settled okay in within the area of chaitanya sarashat mat close to his compound wall mm. and that happened even before my mother's marriage okay my mother was nal age at the time she used to be running around at her youthful age she used to be running around the temple plucking flowers making the garlands for the deities also washing the deities pots okay cleaning the deities temple so guru maharaj's attention some special attention was drawn to her upon seeing here is a little beautiful girl running around with so much mood of service okay with so much uh, happiness to serve their lordships okay cleaning the deities utensils plucking flowers from the 
garden and making garlands, cleaning the temple premises. And whenever Guru Maharaj was asking her to do any service, she would be so happy, so enthusiastic to be doing that. So thus, special attention of Sila Guru Maharaj was drawn to her. So Guru Maharaj started having some special affection towards her. Okay, like uh, as her spiritual daughter in that way. And because, and later on, because I became, I was born as her son. So naturally, Sila Guru Maharaj had some special kind affection. He felt a flow of natural kind and merciful affection towards that baby as a child, okay, as a child of that kind of mother whom Guru Maharaj considered uh, like her spiritual daughter, mm -hmm. even before her marriage. So why am I describing this? So in relation to my mother, in connection with my devoted mother, I also had some fortune to be receiving some special grace and mercy, some loving affection, gracious affection from Sila Guru Maharaj, even from my babyhood. And then later on, I remember when I was around three and a half years of age, I repeat, I was three and a half years old. I could remember playing with Sila Guru Maharaj in my childhood. Okay, playing with Sila Guru Maharaj. I will come to that part later on. So, this is more or less in a nutshell about me. And I also want to add, when later on, because you asked me, Tell me about you. So in that connection, I would love to mention this also. Okay, explain a bit about this. And later on, I officially became initiated by Guru Maharaj. I officially became his, <clears throat> his disciple, adherent disciple at some point. Sila Guru Maharaj told me, who am I? What is the real identity, actual higher identity of myself, of you? He, I think he, a couple of times, explained to me in a very nice, simple way, because I was still young, to in a way that understandable to me, he said, mm, you know who you are. You are none other than a loving servitor of the Supreme Lord, a loving servitor of the divine couple, Radha Krishna. You see their deities are standing on the throne in, the, in my temple. Okay. So you are actually loving servitor of the divine couple. You see Radha Krishna and Mahaprabhu. See, they are sitting at the throne, at the altar in my temple. You could see them. Mm. So I was I was so happy. I was so I was enjoying to hear about my identity from Sila Guru Maharaj was just explaining to me, smilingly, smilingly yes, explaining to me about my identity, a real eternal identity, that mm, you are actually a loving servitor. Mm. I said, oh dear loving servitor of Mahaprabhu and divine couple, says Radha Krishna. And you know, not only that is your identity, it is all of our final, ultimate 
divine identity in eternity. Mm. So naturally, it's also your identity that is real you, that you are a loving servitor of divine couple and Mahaprabhu. And then he also explained to me in that relation, in that connection, let's see, Ahang Brahma Asmi. So you are none other than the part, than an infinitesimal part of the Parang Brahma, Krishna, mm, Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna in another name, another term also called as Parang Brahma. When it is stated in scripture, Ahang Brahma Asmi, means I am Brahma, meaning that I am a humble, tiny, infinitesimal part of that all-pervading, universal, absolute, divine, superpower, Parang Brahma, who, is, who has been personified as Lord Krishna. So, you are, so you are none other than an infinitesimal part of that Krishna, Parang Brahma. Mm. So, then also he says, Ahong Bhagavadang Shosmi, that I am none other than, meaning that you are also none other than, actually a part, an integral part of that Bhagavan, mm. that is real you. And, you know, your connection with that Parang Brahma, with that divine couple, okay, whom you are a part of, is very nice, it's very beautiful, ecstatic, loving, huh? that of love, dedication, that of some de loving devotional relationship. And that is your, your real identity. You have to discover that. Discover your real eternal identity in that, okay, in divine ecstatic love relationship with the divine couple, Mahaprabhu. Ecstatic devotional service relationship with them. That ecstatic Loving devotional relation, in other words, ecstatic love relationship with the Lord. While you are engaged in doing your love service, there is your real identity. That is ultimate you. So Guru Mahal so nicely explained, explained that while I was older around 11, 12 years of age. By that time, I already came to the temple, officially joined. So when I was 11, around 11, 30 or 12 years, Guru Mahaj nicely explained to me philosophically, who am I? Mm -hmm. What is real you? So in this connection, since you asked me, Maharaj, tell us about you. So I also wanted to I wanted to explain that. Thank you. Can, can I just ask an additional question? Um, just for historical yes. context, you, you yes. said that your grandparents were disciples of Srila Bhakti Rakshak Shuddha Maharaj. Mm -hmm. um, in which year or which decade did they, did they receive initiation from him? Hmm. Okay. It has to be in fifties. In the fifties. In nineteen fifties. I was born in nineteen sixty-one. So much before that. Mm. Of course, my biological father got initiated after my birth. Okay, coming in association with my devotee mother. Okay, because my mother was already initiated devotee before her marriage. Mm. So, so 
So after coming in contact with my devotee mother, my biological father got initiated later. But otherwise, my both sides' grandparents, <clears throat> of course, including my mother, all got initiated in uh, 1950s. Wow. I don't exactly remember which was that year, but... Uh, <clears throat> and, okay. and just... Yes. I, I was trying to understand for historical context because your family is from Navadweep. I'm Navadweep sorry to from... interfere. Sorry to interfere. I don't mean 1950. I mean 50, that whole 10 years. Ah. Starting from 50 up to 60. Okay. okay. That's what I mean. Around that, my grandparents and my mother all got initiated. Yes. Wow. Yes. I was trying to work out for historical reference. So your family are from Navadip Dwam, D Dam, Navadweep. Did your grandparents ever meet Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur Prabhupada? No, I have not heard in such a way from them. So most probably they did not. Okay. But they were living in I Navadweep at the time though when no, they maybe i think they they no they came because saraswati thakur prabhupada already departed from this world long back mm. okay 1937 mm. so and i'm talking about the 50s okay so naturally mm. i mean they were situated somewhere else okay. at that time but then uh, answering, responding to the call of their Gurudev, they came later on to be settled around Sichaitanya Saraswati Mahat inside Guru Mahaj mission. So they did not have darshan of Sila Saraswati Goswami Thakur Prabhupada. Okay. And I also tell you, my maternal grandparents were settled in Navadip, in Guru Maharaj within Guru Mahal's temple compound. My paternal grandparents were not. They were from Bardwan. They were uh, around 14 uh, miles, 14 miles far from Navadip Dham. So they used to be living there in Bardhaman district, not uh, inside Chaitanya Shashat Mat or not in Navadip. But my maternal grandparents, Maternal grandparents actually got settled here. Okay, just to clarify it. Wow. But although my paternal grandparents were living uh, around 14 miles, approximately 14 miles far from Navadip Dham, but they were already initiated by that time. So they were initiated disciples of Sila Bhakti Rakshak Siddhar Dev Goswami Maharaj. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for that. Um, um, see, what's great about this podcast is you've told me lots of things about you that I didn't know. Um, I didn't know that you um, were born and raised in Navadweep, and therefore your first meeting with Srila Bhakti, Bhakti Rakshak Shira Dev Goswami Maharaj was, was as a baby. Um, you know, so my, my next question of when was your first meeting with Maharaj? And can you share with us your experiences? I think I'm going to change that question to more around what was it like growing up in the ashram as a teenage boy? So you moved in at the age of 11 or 12, I think. And, yes. And then you lived in the ashram up until you were an adult and beyond. So Tell us a bit about those experiences and what it was like living in the ashram as a teenage boy. Sure, bro. sure. So, like I have already mentioned to you, that I first came in contact with his divine grace, Sila Bhakti Rakshak Siddhar Dev Goswami Maharaj, when I was just a baby. Okay, and when I did not remember anything. Hmm. So my mother laid me down before the lotus feet of Guru Maharaj and smeared me with the taking the blessings from the holy feet of Guru Maharaj, smeared me, rubbed me all over my 
baby body. So then thereafter, <clears throat> so I, I used to be coming naturally with my parents, especially with my mother, okay, in close contact with Guru Maharaj from my very, very young childhood, from my childhood, exactly. So, when, from the time in my childhood, I started more, more or less vividly remembering about my activities, about my, okay, reciprocation, ex exchanges with my Guru Maharaj. It was when I was around three and a half years old, naturally, as, as natural as normal. My parents came to have darshan of their Gurudev. I naturally came with them. They brought their child. So my father used to go away after a few days, staying here, having darshan of Gurudev paying obeisance, hearing Harikatha, then my father had to go away to take care of his family task. But my, my mother continued. Most of the time, my mother would be continuing to be living in her own parents' house. Okay. By the way, the, the name of my uh, father's mother, sorry, the name of my mother's father was Madhupati, Dashadikari Prabhu. Okay. Maninda Shimha. Then Guru Maharaj gave him a spiritual name, Madhupati Dashadikari. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my, my maternal grandma, okay, grandmother, also had a spiritual name. I'm forgetting. It was not so much used, but Anyway, so uh, my mother's name given by Guru Maharaj was Minoti Rani. Okay, uh, Minoti Rani Devi Darshi. So back to the point. So naturally, they used to bring me along. So my as my mother continued staying in her father's house here. I used to be living with her there. And from there, I used to come running to Guru Maharaj, to see Guru Maharaj. Okay, I already learned how to briskly run around. One of my favorite hobbies, to be playing around Sri Chaitanya Saraswati Mat. Okay, running around. Okay, so... Sometimes I remember, okay, and then Sri Guru Maharaj and Krishnamayi Devi also reminded me, I used to be calling Sri Guru Maharaj as Mahanaj, because those days I could not pronounce Maharaj. I could not pronounce Maharaj, but I could, I could call him. I, I, I would be, I used to be calling Maharaj, Guru Maharaj means Mahanaj. Mahanaj Amake Nieja. Meaning, that's Bengali way of saying, but translating into English. Oh, oh Mahanaj, oh Maharaj, I am here, please come and take me. Take me with you. So it was like child's claim, loving claim. Because many times during my mother's stay in her father's house, in her, sorry, not in her parents' house, in, you know, in India, it's more male-oriented family, so I was saying father's house, in her parents' house. So I used to be coming to see Guru Maharaj upstairs in this bhajan kuti. And at that time, Guru Maharaj also would be sitting in this easy chair, same easy chair. This is very old very top class, old, easy chair, so much memories, bearing so much memories of Sila Guru Maharaj, sitting on this, relaxing, writing, speaking so much nectar in Harikatha, 
sitting on this easy chair besides other places. So I used to be coming to see Silo Guru Maharaj running from my maternal grandparents' house over here. And I remember, okay, when I was between three and a half and four years age, I, one day, I, it so happened, I happened to be in, during the afternoon time, around four o'clock in the afternoon, with Guru Maharaj. I straightly came to be with Guru Maharaj in my okay, afternoon time, and I found he was eating chana, freshly uh, chana means curd, freshly made curd from the cow's milk, the home, home taken care cows. The temple had many milk giving cows. So, so Guru Mahal used to be eating, okay, taking chana prasad in the afternoon. I, I, one day I happened to be, and then Guru Mahaj was eating chana prasad over here, and I was just standing here this high, okay, and then as Guru Maharaj was eating, also he was looking at smilingly and started giving me his chana prasad while he was eating his remnant. And I started eating. It was so delicious. Chana prasad, okay, made of fresh cow's milk. The cows, happy cows, was being taken care in Chaitanya Shaushat Mat. Okay, happy, healthy cows. So milk was very tasty. Chana was also very tasty, accordingly. Guru Mahal used to be using sometimes some molasses, some brown sugar, I mean, not polished type of sugar, but little brown color sugar, because polished sugar, Guru Mahal didn't want to eat much. It was so tasty. So what happened? During that time, I have already learned uh, to count the wall clock. So, so although I would be sometimes most, okay, sometimes I would be during the afternoon time in my grandparents' maternal grandparents' house there inside Chaitanya Sarasatma. But I have already learned to count the wall clock. It was a wall clock and it, it would strike during the four o'clock, dong, 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 dong. As soon as he stroked four times, I knew it was four o'clock. It was the time for Sila Guru Maharaj to take Chana Prasha. I remember I used to be running from my you know, maternal grandparents' house, running and come up to, direct would come up to see Guru Maharaj. And then I would see Guru Maharaj taking Chana, or he was just starting to take Chana. Guru Maharaj, looked at smilingly and knew that I came not only to see Guru Maharaj, not only to be with him, but also to eat delicious chana, prasad from him. He smiled at me. <coughs> and then at some point, devoted, devotees would be bringing chana and Guru Maharaj would be giving me his remnants as he was eating. As he continued eating chana, delicious chana, time to time he would be giving me on my hand, okay, on my palm, okay, often. And I love to eat that. And upon seeing that, the disciples of Guru Maharaj who were, who were engaged in preparing the chana for Guru Maharaj increased the amount of chana. Upon knowing, now shareholder came. Now another boy came to take part, okay, take his share now almost every day from their Gurudev's amount, quantity, what they prepare. So they made it double so that there would be no 
scarcity, no shortage of chana for their Gurudev. And the chana was made, I remember, from the freshly made lemon juice, Gandharaj Lebu, from, from, the, from the Mott's land, that, that there was a very nice lemon tree here, lime tree. And it was so fragrant. And devotees used to use that kind of lemon or lime juice to prepare, to prepare chana. So that was one of my experiences of being with Sila Guru Maharaj while tasting his prasad. And one of the ways of developing some loving, close relationship with Guru Maharaj in my childhood <clears throat> through eating his delicious prasadam. And Guru Maharaj would also feel happy. Sometimes it even happened, sometimes if one or two days I would not come during that time, Guru Maharaj would be asking for why he did not come. Okay, call him. So devotees felt and devotees said, why you are not coming? You should be responsible. Our Gurudev loves to see you. Become so much happy to see you. He wants to give you his prasad. Okay, but why... Because I was a child, so some maybe some day I did not come. But Guru Maharaj remembered me affectionately. And he called me. Then I came and then he gave me Chana Prasad. Then he became happy. Devotees felt, see, now our Guru Maharaj is so happy that he gave you his Prasad while he is eating. It is our Guru Maharaj's satisfaction, happiness. In that way, Guru Maharaj felt some causeless mercy and merciful you know affection for for this boy then i remember thereafter i remember playing with guru maharaj you know sometimes then after three and a half years of age as i was growing i remember playing with him while he was he went down to give a round all around chaitanya sarasat mat to see everything with his own eyes, how everything, all services going on around his temple. So I used to be following Sila Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj was this tall, so tall, I was so little. And I remember, I used to be catching hold, catching hold of Guru Maharaj Uttariya, Sannasa Uttariya. And I would be sometimes walking before him, catching hold, holding his uttariya. You know, the way the children do. Okay, walking before Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj used to be walking with a big stick. Big stick in his hand. I used to be holding that stick and walking before Guru Maharaj. Sometimes I used to be going around and around and around while Guru Maharaj was walking. I used to be going around and around Guru Maharaj it was a part of my play with him. Still, Guru Maharaj was in the motion, slow motion, motion of his normal walking. And I was, you know, doing parikrama, giving round and round of Guru Maharaj and going, my play. Okay, and Guru Maharaj was enjoying my play. Sometimes holding Guru Maharaj's stick and I was going round. It is a part of my play. You know, I remember... One day it so happened, some construction work of Chaitanya Saraswat Mat was still going on at that time. So nearby, nearby a place inside Chaitanya Saraswat Mat, while Guru Maharaj was walking, walking by, there was a stack of sand kept for construction work and all sand. All of a sudden, what happened? Some I I used to be naughty also in my childhood. So in the mode of play with Guru Maharaj, while Guru Maharaj was walking, I ran to this, yes, you know, playfully ran to the stack of sand and took a handful of sand and threw it, threw it on Guru Maharaj, threw it on Guru Maharaj Uttariya. And other disciples were following Guru Maharaj at that time. They were very disturbed. They were showing me their big eyes behind Guru Maharaj. 
what you are doing, it's not okay to so to throw sands on Guru Maharaj. What did you do? Not okay to sand to 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 throw sands on Guru Maharaj. Then I then I came to understand. I could realize some way. Oh, I did not do something right, but I did in a playful mode, innocently, the part of my play with Guru Maharaj. Okay. Then as soon as they, they showed me some face, disturbed faces, Guru Maharaj's disciples, then I came, I went close by Guru Maharaj and started rubbing off, you know, rubbing off those sands I threw on Zutariya. And Guru Maharaj was just looking at me and smiling. He did not feel disturbed. He was just taking it in a very normal, simple way that I threw hands on him in a playful way, in a childish way. Okay. So, but the disciples following behind Guru Maharaj were disturbed with me. They were saying, you, you did not do something right. You cannot do that to Guru Maharaj. Okay. You need, you need to be a good boy. So they were uh, they, are, they are saying something to me, teaching something in a bit uh, disturbed way, irritated way, like that. But Guru Maharaj, I looked at Guru Maharaj's face. I found he was just smiling and happy with me. Then I looked at his disciples' face and they were feeling disturbed, annoyed. Then I was trying to judge. My Guru Maharaj is so happy. He is not feeling disturbed. Why these guys are feeling so unhappy? Disturbed with me. What did I do wrong? Okay, my Guru Maharaj, he is feeling happy. He is not saying anything to me. And he was rather enjoying when I was rubbing off all those sands from his uttariya in that way. But why these disciples, they are so unhappy? I could not understand properly. Hmm? My Guru, Guru Maharaj is happy and they are disturbed. Okay, so I was just looking at them rather than I looked back. I looked back at those disciples of Guru Maharaj, kind of trying to tell them, what's wrong with you all guys? What's wrong with you all? See, my Guru Maharaj is happy. He's not un unhappy with me or angry. Why? What's, the, what's something wrong with you all rather that you are feeling so unhappy with me, see. And Guru Maharaj was enjoying in that way. So many other parts, you know, Sila Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj Ji, who, who used to be known during the time of Sila Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada, one of the most venerable, exalted God brothers of Guru Maharaj, who used to be known as Aprakrita Bhakti Saranga Prabhu. Okay, during the time of Sila Saraswati Goswami Thakur Prabhupada. Then later on, he took sannyasa. Okay, after the departure, disappearance of the Bhakti Siddhanta, he took sannyasa from Sila Guru Maharaj. I mean, he was one of the god brothers of Guru Maharaj who accepted sannyasa order from Guru Maharaj. So then later on, at some point, as a token of his respect, okay, of his respect and some loving presentation to Guru Maharaj, he gave a revolving chair to Guru Maharaj. He presented a revolving chair to Guru Maharaj, okay, uh, for, for him to make use of, for, for him to sit, okay, it was a revolving chair, so it was uh, more, it was easier for Guru Maharaj to sit on that and revolve, okay, change the direction, any direction he wanted to. So he presented Guru Maharaj with a, uh, a rev revolving chair. So in this bhajan kuti, Srila Guru Maharaj used to be sitting on that revolving chair and he used to be writing, he used to be engaged in writing. Okay, some beautiful hymns. Sometimes he used to be sitting on this easy chair. Sometimes he used to be sitting on that revolving chair with a table. 
and he used to be engaged in writing a beautiful hymns, sotras. So then, as I started growing up from my childhood, I naturally developed a very loving, friendly relationship with Guru Maharaj. Because officially, I did not understand him as my guru, divine, spiritual master, you know. But I just grew a very, how do you say, very intimate, loving relationship with Sila Guru Maharaj. Like my beloved father, my beloved son, my beloved spiritual father and spiritual son. Okay, so that was, I did not understand much about spiritual father and spiritual son mm. during those times so much. But like loving father and loving son. So that was the starting point of my natural relationship okay, with Guru Maharaj. That's how it developed between his divine grace, so Guru Maharaj and myself. And Guru Maharaj also indulged in that. He also promoted that by playing with me. You know, one of the great qualifications, qualities of the exalted pure devotees of Lord that sometimes they often become childlike. They, do, they never become childish. But one of their sweet qualities, Vaishnava qualities, that they often become childlike. So Guru Maharaj also had that great quality in him. He often used to be childlike and playing with me in a meaningful way. I was going to, I'm going to describe all those to you, how meaningful he played. Meaningful way, he used to be playing with me. And he used to be sometimes, or on many occasions, sorry, I repeat, many times he used to be rather coming down on my level, on a child's level, to relate to me, to be playfully relating to me divine messages, some great spiritual messages, in a way understandable to me, in a playful way. Okay. So he liked, Guru Maharaj liked to play with the small child. Okay. So I remember. So he used to be very so sweetly, lovingly playful with me, very childlike way. So as a part of that relationship with Guru Maharaj, so what happened? You know, that revolving chair used to be staying in the, I still remember, in that eastern portion of his baranda, Bhajan Kuti, eastern portion. And what happened, few times, Guru Maharaj just in a playful mode, flowing with me in a playful mode, he made me sit on that revolving chair, on his own chair. Wow. And and started revolving, started revolving me around and began to teach me all the directions, east, you know, you know, east, north, west, south, or east. Okay, east, south, west, north. Okay, he, he used to be revolving me in both ways. Okay, sometimes east, north, west, south, or sometimes starting from east. Okay, then south, west, north, again coming to the east. So I still remember, sweetly remember, Guru Maharaj used to be revolving me and teach me all these directions. This is east, this is called south, this is called north, this is west. And he even taught me in between those two, sorry, in between uh, the four main directions, you know, east, east, north, west, south, or east, south, you know, west, north, in the corner directions also, Ishan cone, Noirip cone, in this way, Bayu cone, Agni cone. Then he also taught me. Urdha means above, and Adha means 
above my head and sky and below that direction also. Below, <clears throat> above me, below me. <clears throat> so, so this way is to be revolving me and teaching me smilingly different directions in details. And then, then it used to be my turn. It happened several times, not one time. It happened several times. It was a part of play with Guru Maharaj, between me and Guru Maharaj. Okay. It happened several times day, during the daytime. Then, you know, what I was going to say. Oh, then it, it used to be my turn. After Guru Maharaj made me sit on that revolving chair and revolve me around, then it would be my claim. I I would simply come off, okay, from that chair to be my turn to make Guru Maharaj sit on that same revolving chair, and I must then I would revolve him. Then to fulfill my desire, to fulfill my claim, now Guru and thereafter Guru Maharaj sat. And I tried to revolve him, but I could not do much because he was so heavy, big. He was big for me, sitting on the, heavily sitting on the revolving chair. And I was trying to revolve him. So Guru Mahal was helping me with the help of his feet so that I could also revolve him and feel happy. Guru Mahal revolved me and in return, I also revolved him. Okay. Guru Mahaj was like assisting me so that I could revolve him well. And it was a part of my okay, joyful game, part of my joyful play with Guru Maharaj. Okay, he revolved me. Now let I am also revolving him. And Guru Mahaj would enjoy. Okay, like that. See, I still remember. Guru Mahaj would see, I cannot. Describe everything to you in details. Oh, it is like oceanic memory from my childhood throughout boyhood and youthful days, full of sweet memories. I'm just touching, giving you some mm. glimpse. During... Let me finish a few, mm. few more mm. points mm. just in this regard. And I remember sometimes I used to be coming to be with Guru Maharaj in the evening time and during the evening time, there was a beautiful night sky, cloudless night sky of him. And he used to be showing me, pointing me towards the night sky filled with stars and all the galaxies. And he used to teach me different astrological, astronomical science. You know, how do you call? Mm. You know, there are different, I forget the English name, all the astrological symbols. Co constellations. Is it, is it constellations. constellations. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. He used to be teaching me different constellations in the cloudless night sky of Navadev and teaching me about Dhruvatara, the pole star, and different stars and constellations, all, and trying to educate me about the cosmic. Mystical cosmic creations. Okay. And then I learned some of the constellations from Guru Maharaj. In Bengali, we call Sanskrit Kal Purusha, Mesh, Visha, Mithun, Karkata, all these constellations named Vedic names, Kanna, okay, Dhanur, Meen, okay, Makara, all this many. Okay. I learned from Guru Maharaj. Many all those astrological signs, constellations from Guru Maharaj. Then at some point he told me, Have you seen the beautiful deities in my temple? I said, Yes. Can you tell me who are who? I said, I, you know, in the beginning I saw Mahaprabhu like Krishna. I say, Two Krishnas and Radharani. Guru Maharaj said, oh, true, Mahaprabhu, but he is not exactly Krishna. He is called Lord, Lord Gauranga. He said, 
he said Gaura Shunda, that is his deity's name given by Guru Maharaj. He said Guru Gauranga Gandharva Govinda Shunda. Guru Gaura Shunda Gandharva Govinda Shunda. He said that is Mahaprabhu, one who is sitting in on the throne on the right side of Krishna, okay, raising one hand upward, called Mahaprabhu, Gaushundara, and thereafter Krishna, and then Radharani. He taught me. I thought, I said, okay, okay, I see Guru Maharaj. I was speaking in Bengali, but now I'm telling you in English. Then Guru Maharaj suddenly asked me, do you know who is that Krishna standing with the flute standing in, in my temple, okay, on that Singhasana with the flute, holding the flute. I said, I know Krishna is so sweet. He's, I know his flute player because he's holding the flute in his hand. So he must be a great flute player. Then Guru Mahar said, he's not only flute player, you know, he is the actual owner of this whole universe. You are seeing in the night sky. Because he was telling me about mm. telling me about them while he was teaching me, okay, the night sky, all the stars and constellations. During that period of time, evening time, as I was watching with Guru Mahas the night sky and he was teaching me. Then he said, Do you know? that Krishna is actually the owner of this whole universe. You are seeing in the sky and this, including this earth. Okay, then my eyes were getting bigger in surprise. Oh, it's in the amazement, my eyes got in, getting bigger. Oh, he is the actual owner, Lord, master of the whole universe. Guru Mahal said, yes, he is actually the master owner of this whole universe. So next time you pay your pranam respect to him, you must know and must pay your pranam, offer your pranam with that in your knowledge, with that in your mind. You're actually offering your obeisance to him who is none other than the owner, Lord of the whole universe. Then it got inside my brain that it entered my head. Okay. And whenever I paid my obeisance before the temple deities, I always remember that actually I'm paying my obeisance to the Lord of the universe, master, owner of the universe, Krishna, who is sitting, who is uh, standing here holding, beautifully holding the flute. My Guru Maharaj said, I am paying my pranam to the master, owner of the universe in this way. So many sweet memories, you know. And then as I grew up, there's so many more memories. Even I have got more childhood memories, but I know it will be taking a long time. Okay, so. One question I particularly want to ask is about um, the 1970s and, and maybe the 1980s as well. So from the time you were born, 1961, to the time that yes. Shida Shida Maharaj left the planet, 1988. Lots of personalities, senior Vaishnavas, spiritual personalities would have come to meet Maharaj and discourse with him, such as A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Shila Prabhupada, and maybe other God brothers as well, such as Puri Maharaj. Are you able to share yes. any of those memories of those senior God brothers coming to meet Srila Bhakti Rakshak Shida Dev Goswami Maharaj? Yes, of course. Of course, with so much happiness. See, this is what I will not be, I'm not going to speak for the first time. I have already explained about this, narrated about this in many other spiritual assemblies during my Harikatha, but because it has been one of the most common and very commonly fundamental important questions in several of my Harikatha assemblies. Okay, so I will be so happy to narrate to you again. Please, please. So, 
Yes. During my staying, since I joined, I mean, since I came in contact with Guru Maharaj from my babyhood, thereafter from my childhood, and I grew up through my boyhood and juvenile time, youthful days. So naturally, I have I had the immense fortune of seeing the get together of my Guru Maharaj and many of his other exalted, venerable God brothers here in Chaitanya Sarsatma, right in this Bhajan Kutir. This Bhajan Kutir has actually been a, a very holy place for unity and harmony. In other words, this holy Bhajan Kutir of Srila Guru Maharaj has been a place of great happy union. Okay, get together hmm, between Sila Guru Maharaj among, okay, and so many other stalwart God brothers. So I had the great fortune of seeing with Sila Guru Maharaj other God brothers here, of course, like, okay, firstly, Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada Maharaj. So Guru Maharaj him. And thereafter, so Guru Maharaj, Sisila Bhakti Daita Madhav Goswami Maharaj. So Guru Maharaj, Sisila Bhakti Pramod Puri Goswami Maharaj. So Guru Maharaj, Sila Bhakti Vichar Jajavar Goswami Maharaj. So Guru Maharaj, Sila Bhakti Kamal Madhusudan Goswami Maharaj. And thereafter, Sila Bhakti Alok Paramahamsa Goswami Maharaj. Then Akinchan Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj. Then uh, I remember hazily in my very childhood, hazily remember, I also saw uh, Bhaktisila Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj with Guru Maharaj also over here. But I was very, very young. Wow. I could hazily remember because he left planet earlier. And most probably Sila Keshav Goswami Maharaj but that was before I officially joined Guru Maharaj's temple and officially started permanently staying in Guru Maharaj's temple when I was 11 years old in 1971. But because I started coming to Guru Maharaj's temple and being here with my parents, with my mother especially, much before that from my very childhood, you know. So therefore, I had that chance but I, I could also somewhat remember, I might have also seen Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj with Guru Maharaj, but I very hazily, vaguely remember. Okay, but little bit clearer remembrance I have got, little bit clearer in my memory about seeing Guru Maharaj and Sri Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj. He was also a stout figure, okay, both of them with Guru Maharaj. But thereafter, the other names of God brothers, stalwart God brothers of Guru Maharaj, I just mentioned. I remember them very clearly, very vividly. Mm. And even rem remember how I heard their Harikatha, their intimate discussion of Harikathas, okay, between them. So, who else? Uh, uh, sometimes, yes, another God brother, Bhakti Saran Shanto. Bhakti Saran Shanto Goswami Maharaj. Also, uh, <laughs> a few times, Sila Bhakti Umud Shanto Goswami Maharaj. Okay, with Guru Maharaj. He came to attend his Vyasa Puja, Guru Maharaj Vyasa Puja ceremony at that time. So, and also Sila Bhakti Kankan Taposhi Goswami Maharaj, Guru Maharaj. Other God brother Nayanananda Das Babaji Maharaj, and so on. Mm. So on. Also, Bhakti Sodha Asram Maharaj, Bhakti, who was known as Srimad Bhuta, Sripad Bhuta Vridhas Brahmachari during his Brahmachari time. Later on, he became Bhakti Sodha Asram Maharaj. Mm. Most probably, okay, I'm not sure, Srimad Bhakti Bhayabhav Puri Goswami Maharaj, okay. 
maybe one time he came, but I hazily remember. Uh, I was very young. Mm. Can I so, just just say, Maharaj, one of the sannyasis you mentioned, uh, Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj. Yes. I believe he visited the UK in the 1930s. So, um, yes, I believe he's he spent... was one of those disciples whom Saraswati mm. Thakur Prabhupada sent in the Britain. OK, yeah, England. He, he was here between October 1936 and October 1937. So that's when you mentioned his name 20 minutes ago, I was ruffling around with my notes because I remember reading about him and researching about him. And mm. there's different view. There was a very well known. Uh, disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur in the UK called Daisy Botel, who was given the name Vinod Vani Devi Dasi. And she was one of the mm -hmm. first members of the Gaudiya Mission UK. Mm -hmm. However, there's differences of opinion over who she was initiated by. And there is mm -hmm. some, there is a possible view that she was actually initiated by Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's differences of opinion over that. So that's why his name, particularly my my ears perked up because you mentioned his name. And there's a strong, there's a link to the UK going back almost 90 years, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. well, actually 90, almost 90 years. Mm -hmm. um, but So that's, that's just phenomenal. And some of those personalities that you've mentioned, um, are you able to just maybe recall any of the discourses with, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, sorry, Srila Bhakti Rakshak, Srila Dev Goswami Maharaj, and maybe, maybe Srila Prabhupada. You able to discuss, maybe remember any of the things that they, they discussed? Certainly. A lot I remember <laughs> about the discussion about the intimate Harikatha exchanges between Srila Guru Maharaj and Srila Swami Prabhupada. Okay. So before that, Okay, before <clears throat> touching on this point, I'd also like to reflect on that Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj and Binod Bani Devi Dashi. Yes, even though, I mean, although Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj initiated him, sorry, although Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj initiated her, mm. but that was given on behalf of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Thakur in that way. Because during the time, during the time period of their own guru, of his own guru, he could not directly initiate anyone as his direct disciple. But he did it as a ritik on his behalf. Srila mm. uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Thakur Prabhupada. So that way, she should be considered as a disciple of Saraswati Goswami Thakur Prabhupada. Because whether Srila Bhakti Saranga Goswami Maharaj or Srila Bhakti Hidai Ban Goswami Maharaj or Srila Bhakti Pradeep Titha Goswami Maharaj, whoever uh, went to the Western country, European country, they all sent by Srila Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada as his representative. So whichever disciples are taken, accepted all on behalf. Mm. For Sila Saraswati Goswami Thakur Prabhupada in that way. They were, they were simply mediating, mm. Okay, mm. playing the role of mediator on his behalf. Okay, now, now touching on the point of the great events, great, you know, most excellent, beautiful, okay, events of gatherings of, of Srila Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Maharaj Ji, Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj's place. Tell you, I have had that experience several times. Okay. To seeing them together in Chaitanya Saraswat Mahat here, in this Bhajan Kuti, at least five times. Okay. So, first I remember Srila so Swami Prabhupada Ji came along with his accompanied by his disciples after his successful preaching in the Western countries. First he came 
I started remembering from that time onward. Okay. If you see some of the photographs, you could also see in one of the photographs I am seen to be paying obeisance, Dandavat Pranam to him. <laughs> During the then Chaitanya Sarasat Mat. Okay. <laughs> Myself and Haricharan Prabhu were paying. Dandavat pranam to him, Panchanga pranam to him as he entered the mod before the Chaitanya Sarasat mod temple. So, and then I remember we would be receiving him so respectfully. At some point, he would come up to see Guru Maharaj okay, on his bhajan kutir on the first floor. Mm. Then, so, Five to six times I have seen both these exalted God brothers, exalted, beloved, intimate God brothers. Okay. And the, my experience of seeing, having darshan of both of them together and hearing Harikatha from their lotus leaves, hearing their exchanges, were simply, were simply nectarian. Beautiful and beautiful, so nectarian experience. Mm -hmm. So now I going back to the first point. I first saw Sri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada Ji coming accompanied by his disciples and stayed here for several days. Here, Guru Mahaj allotted a big house nearby Chaitanya Sarasvamat for him to be staying with all his disciples. Okay, then every day he would come. See Guru Maharaj, spend time with Guru Maharaj that way. It was before 71, before I officially joined this Chaitan to be living in Chaitanya Sarasadmat permanently. Then I just happened to be coming with my parents and I was here and he also came with his disciples in that way. I, could, I can still remember, remember Sutakirti, Ramanuja, Achyutananjo, the very older day disciples of him. They also developed a nice friendship with me. Okay, from those old days. Anyway, a lot of things. I'm skipping that part, coming directly to the part of the Harikatha. See, I still remember. It's still so alive and fresh in my memory as if it happened the other day. Not so many years passed by. It just happened the other day so fresh. Okay, so fresh in my memory. I remember, you know, we, Guru Maharaj's disciples and his disciples, Sila Swami Prabhupada's disciples, would be sitting surrounding both these exalted pure devotees of Lord and be engaged, absorbed in hearing their Harikatha for hours. Okay, nectar in Harikatha for hours. Sometimes Guru Mahaj would be speaking. So, Swami, Swami Maharaj Ji, Swami Prabhupada Ji would be listening and appreciating, relishing. And other time, it was his turn in reciprocation. He would be speaking and Guru Mahaj would be listening and relishing, appreciating. So, it was a beautiful reciprocation, reciprocative Harikathas flowing between two intimate God brothers for hours. Okay, reciprocative Harikatha. Exchanging. Uh, ek, the Harikatha with intimate exchanges. Like personifying the meaning of that verse of Upadeshamritam, Dadati, Pratigrihinati, Guija Makhati, Prichati. Hmm? We could, I could see the Dadati, Pratigrihinati, giving and taking, divine giving, Devotional giving and taking between two God brothers. De divinely devotional uh, giving and taking going on through exchanges between two exalted beloved God brothers. Sometimes they would be, mostly they would be speaking in Bengali. Or if, most, if not mostly, sometimes they would be speaking in their nat native language, Bengali, other times in English. Mm. So... And we would be sitting surrounding both this, both their divine graces and absorbed in tasting the 
nectar in Harikatha, the nectar of their Harikatha flowing. Oh, and they would be appreciating each other so much through their reciprocations and rec reciprocative appreciations and exchanges. Okay. And most of their Harikathas would, would be taking place centering their Gurudev. Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsri Thakur Prabhupada. Most of the their Harikatha topics would be starting with how their Gurudev would be reflecting, would be delivering on this topic. Okay, would be explaining the same topic of the Harikatha. So it was their Guru centered Harikatha. Okay, how, how our Guru Maharaj means, meaning Sri Sarsri. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarsri Thakur Prabhupada would be okay, presenting, explaining this particular topic of Harikatha. And both the God Brothers would be releasing, centering the mood of the same Harikatha as it would be explained okay, by their Gurudev. So it was one of the lovely characteristics of uh, their Harikatha exchanges. Mm centering their Gurudev, their Gurudev's mood. And time to time, they would go deeper. They would go, they would go deeper and be more absorbed, okay, more intimate way about explaining, okay, interpreting, explaining the innermost meanings of that particular topics of their Harikatha, okay, and they would be releasing like anything, both the God Brothers, through exchanges. Mm. Recipro through their lovely reciprocations, they would be releasing, okay, to hear it so much from each other. Okay. And sometimes when they would be, sometimes when they would be speaking in their native language, you know, Bengali, then, of course, the disciples of Sila, Swami Prabhupada Ji, would be sitting, would not understand anything, but they would be looking at, looking up and looking at the face of their Gurudev, Sila Swami Prabhupada, and seeing him so joyful, so happy, happy, happily relating, reciprocating with Sila Siddhar Maharaj, and Sila Siddhar Goswami Maharaj was also happily reciprocating back, okay, relating back to him, lovely, sweet reciprocation going on between them and they could not understand because it was in Bengali. So once they could not stay, they were so impatient, they could not wait anymore. They would just ask, on some of his disciples of Swami Prabhupada just asked him, uh, Sila Prabhupada, what are, you, what are you discussing and releasing with Siddhar Maharaj in Bengali? He, okay. We can't understand. Then Sri Swami Prabhupada cutely turned to, to our sin and remarked, you know that famous remark, if I tell you, you will faint. <laughs> if, I, if I tell you, you are going to faint. Meaning better you don't hear it now. Mm. Okay. But we could understand because it was in Bengali that way. And later on, of course, that part was translated. The Bengali part of discussion got translated into English also. So, marvelous experience. Okay, marvelous, sweet experience of nectar in Harikatha flowed from this place. Okay, hours after hours. And when Sila Swami Prabhupada used to come over here, naturally he used to be spending uh, at least a couple of days here, mostly. Sometimes three nights, the three days, around three days, in this way. So they used to be sittings with each other few times, okay? Not one or two times during his stay. Several times they used to have sitting. I mean, during when he stayed here, Sri Swami Prabhupada. Sometimes happened he did not, could not stay longer time after Chandadai temple already 
after the Mahapur Chandradoy temple came into being, then he used to go back. But before, I'm talking also, also before Mahapur Chandradoy temple came into existence, before there was no Mayapur Chandradoy temple, okay? Then whenever Srila Swami Prabhupada came to Navadip Mayapur Dham, okay? So uh, he had no, his own place to stay, own temple yet. So he, he used to be mostly, he used to come across after having darshan of Charitannamot, Jagopit, all this. Then he used to come across the Ganga, on the western banks of Ganga. And sometimes uh, he, used, uh, he used to be going to Devananda Gauriamat, I mean, so the temple of uh, Pujabat Keshav Goswami Maharaj, Bhakti Pogan Keshav Goswami Maharaj. And most of the times he would straightly come to this Chaitanya Sarasat Mat of Sila Guru Maharaj. And he used to be staying here. Okay. It is much before the Mayapur Chandadai temple actually came into existence. Then thereafter, both the God brothers discussed between them. And finally, uh, Guru Maharaj advised him. He accepted the suggestion of Guru Maharaj to buy that piece of land of the today's Mayapur, okay? Futures Mayapur Chandadai temple, the land you see today, temple land, it was suggested by Srila Guru Maharaj, and it was fully accepted with appreciation by Srila Swami Prabhupada Ji Maharaj. So, so like Ochudananda and some other disciples continued to be staying in Chaitanya Sarasat Mat, for taking care of, okay, buying that Mayapur Chandadai temple land and all to start a beautiful, wonderful temple there. So, so while I'm talking before the Mayapur Chandadai temple, okay, then naturally, whenever Sri Swami Prabhupada Ji came, accompanied by his disciples and all, every time, Every, almost every time he stayed in Navadip Charitanya Sarasat Mat. He was our most respected, adored, beloved guest. And I would rather say, we never, you know, Guru Maharaj, we never treated him as any guest. He was like our second host, mm -hmm. our second loving guardian of Guru Maharaj's temple. That's what that's how we felt about Srila Swami Prabhupada in relation to Guru Maharaj. And through intimate relation between both of them, we, we did not even consider Srila Swami Prabhupada's disciples like our cousin God brothers, but our real God brothers, same near and dear family, same loved family. Okay, and we considered Srila Swami Prabhupada ji as our second loving guardian, spiritual father. That was, that was what that has been our, you know, loved feelings, feelings of relationship with him mm -hmm. in relation to Guru Maharaj or in relation to each other, in relation to each other. Mm -hmm. So we have always considered, felt it was, we're the same family, same beloved family. Thank you. So, Thank you. And, And, and you know, in this connection, I would also want to remark, point out that the idea of the Vedic planetarium, a beautiful, wonderful Vedic planetarium safe temple, what Srila Swami Prabhupada wanted to be built in this Mayapur Chandadai temple, okay, was also discussed here in this Bhajan Kuti right here. In the, Okay, which place now I'm talking to you from. Okay, that beautiful idea, suggestion, realization came in Guru Maharaj 
and Guru Maharaj expressed to Srila Swami Prabhupada Ji, and he immediately embraced that, okay, accepted and fully supported it, appreciated that, that yes, a gorgeous temple must be built with this idea, that of Vedic planetarium, showing Bhur, Bhuva, Sha, Maha, Jana, Tapa, Satya, Lok, Viraja, all these layers and levels. Okay, then Viraja, <clears throat> Vaikuntha, Parabhoma, Vaikuntha. Then in that way, Vaikuntha, Ajadha, Daroka, Mathura, Vrindavana, Gokula, mm, then Radha Kunda, and Vrindavana, they, the Guru Maharaj finished ultimately up to Vrindavana in this way. So, mm, so the, the idea of such beautiful, gorgeous temple was originated, originated over here following the ways of descriptions of uh, Brihad Bhagavata Amritam, the way Gopakuma, you know, passed through the different levels, uh, passed through different spiritual levels to be ultimately united with his Lord Krishna, Sakkarasa, in Vrindavan, ultimately. So, so this idea came originally came from that Brihad Bhagavata Amritam. Wow. As the Gopakumar passed through different levels. And Guru Maharaj described about that to Srila Swami Prabhupada. Both the God brothers, both the God brothers discussed about it and happily agreed, accepted this idea. Wow. Thank you, Maharaj. I I Loved hearing about those discourses between Srila Shida Maharaj and, and Srila Prabhupada. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay, next next question. Um, you you and you might have answered this already, but we'll see. Um, what is the greatest thing that Srila Shida Maharaj shared with you? What is the greatest thing that he taught you during your your time with him? Okay. Okay. Before <clears throat> before going ahead to touch on this point, I'd like to draw your attention to. If you also want to know a little more in details about how I heard Hari Katha. Okay. Loving sweet Hari Katha, the topics of Hari Katha took place between these two God brothers. You could find it out from my websites from certain specific topics where I describe a little more in details about. So okay, well, just well with this podcast I'll make sure that your website is listed so okay so the viewers can go and look at it and find out more mm. about your 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 work and your saver and your missionary activities. You Most can definitely. also contact Maloti Devi Dashi from Prague. She she's taking care of my websites. So she can point out about those topics, help you to exactly find out <coughs> those topics. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. So please repeat your question. Yes. What is the greatest thing that Srila Bhakti Rakshak Shidardev Goswami Maharaj taught you during your time with him? Yes. Now I'm thinking. <laughs> greatest teacher. There are so many. You know, it's like I give you some example. Like a flower. Okay, flower cluster. Sometimes you can find in India, we sometimes find very beautiful looking flower cluster, all different colorful petals. Those petals are not of the same color, different colors. So that flower is composed of different color petals. 
was looking with the different colors, various colors, sometimes little various shapes. Uh, it adds to the beauty of that flower. In a similar way, also in the lotus, sometimes the about <laughs> when we look at look into the uh, species of lotus flowers, see we find white lotus, golden lotus, blue lotus, rosy lotus. So which one is better than who? All are so greatly beautiful. All look great. All look and feel great with their own beauty and fragrance and qualities. In a similar way, it is difficult to really choose the highest or best of the teachings, the most important teachings of Guru Maharaj in that way. I cannot, I will collect all those lotuses, you know, blue lotus, white lotus, uh, rosy lotus, golden lotus, all together, okay? Together in one place and want to present to you, this is what Guru Maharaj says, in harmony, with unification, instead of only pick, picking up only one, Okay, or two or three even. Because they're so interrelated. Absolute. So I feel like relating to them. I actually relate to them in absolute, other absolute way rather than relatively better, relatively best, relatively very important, like that. Mm. Like a flower, beautiful flower garland with many flowers together in our garland. That's how I see the great teachings of Sila Guru Maharaj, best teachings. But since you are asking me in particular, okay, what I can principally remember, like, Sila Guru Maharaj laid so much stress, so much importance on Sharanagati, loving dedication, doing service, to Mahaprabhu divine couple with ecstatic love dedication, ecstatic loving devotion. Okay. He often said, service, service, service. Service is our life. Okay. While you are while you are engaging in your devotional service, chant holy names of Lord. While you are engaging in chanting holy names of Lord, in your mouth, on your tongue, in your mind, engage your hands in devotional service. Because both complement each other. Both aspects actually supplement and complement, promote each other. Service should not be without chanting and singing holy names. Okay, and chanting or singing holy names should also not be without devotional services. Actually, world of Nama Bhajan already included within the world of devotional, ecstatic devotional services. And the world of devotional services also included within the ecstatic Nam Bhajan, world of Nam Bhajan. Inseparably, they are self-included, inseparably they are included within each other in the Goloka conception in the full-fledged, tasty conception, full-fledged, con absolute conception of Krishna consciousness, ecstatic, divinely ecstatic, devotional singing of Krishna's, Radha Krishna's glories, Mahaprabhu's glories, and engaging in the ecstatic devotional services are inseparably interrelated, okay? interrelated. Sometimes so one promotes the other. Not only one complements the other, one promotes the other. They are actually the same existence. Holistically, they are the same reality. While we are absorbing, Guru Mahasad said, while we are absorbing 
in chanting and singing divine couples Nam, Roop, Guna, Leela, Parikara, Vaisishta. I mean that their divine name, fame, form, qualities, okay, and uh, special, uh, uh, special characteristics of intimate love relationships between divine couple and their intimate associates, devotees, Parikara, Vaisishta, okay. <clears throat> They all are related to the world of ecstatic devotional service. So, and while we are engaged in ecstatic devotional service, Guru Mahārāj says, I repeat, while we are engaged in a devotional love service, then all our senses are also engaged to do something for Krishna with that, besides only Nam Bhajana. So Guru Mahaj always laid a special stress. Do Nam Bhajana along with your loving devotional service. And do your loving devotional service along with Nam Bhajana. When both are combined, it will yield a great result, mm -hmm. high class result, divine result in your spiritual life, in the life of in the life of spiritual cultivation, higher spiritual cultivations. Mm. or cultivations of higher spiritual life. So <laughs> back to the point. The Guru Mahārāj said, Sarivis, 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 Sarivis is our life. Okay. And he asked how to engage in that Sarivis? Through Saranāgati. Anukulla sasankal pratikulla vivajjanam then rakhishyati ti vishyāsho I am not going into the explanation of the whole verse, it will take hours. Just I'm only touching on some particular points in this relation. He said, after Anukulasa Sankalpa, Pratikulla Vibarjan, this, this verse is one of the definitions of love surrender, you know, love dedication, Saranagati. So after Anukulasa Sankalpa, Pratikulla Vibarjan, then come Rakshi Shati Tibishasho, Goptrite Baranang Tatha, meaning, that you feel, try to have that feeling within you, or cultivate that feeling in you with some loving claim that since you have accepted, since you have wholeheartedly, sincerely, wholeheartedly accepted the shelter of Radha Krishna's lotus feet, their divine shelter, then you know you are their devotee. In whatever level you are, you may be in Konishthadikari level, Madhumadikari, or what to speak more of Uttamadhikari level. Whatever level, whatever level you are, okay, don't, okay, don't uh, be so much bothered about, okay, but just become, fully become sincere, even on your Konishthadikari level, become fully sincere and pure and feel. I have become feel and give message to Krishna, relay your message to Krishna, Radha Thakura, Mahaprabhu. I have become your devotees. So, please. So, you will be taking care of me. I am in your shelter. I have embraced your shelter, my Lord. So, I know you will be protecting me. You will be taking care of me protecting me, nurturing me in my devotional life with all your mercy, with causeless, your benevolent grace and causeless mercy. You will be kindly taking care of me, protecting me, nurturing me. I have got that faith in you, firm faith in you, O divine couple, O my divine master and mistress. I have got that faith in you. Okay, you cannot, you cannot ignore me. Okay, you cannot ignore me. You cannot neglect me. You must know I am your devotee. I have accepted your shelter, no matter with what capacity, to in what degree or in what capacity, small capacity. I have accepted that because I am not a big devotee. 
I'm not your big devotee. I do not yet have that capacity. So maybe I am I am on the Konishtarikari level. But you are great. I may be I may be so small. I am I am so small, too small, tiny servitor of you, trying to serve you, relate with you, with some feelings of devotion and faith in you. But you are such big Lord with big heart. So much, okay, so much grace, graciousness, so much benevolence, graciousness, mercy. So I remind you, you are you are Lord, the Lord of great mercy. You are you are you you two are the lordships, you two are the lordships of great benevolence, mercy, graciousness. And here I am the fit recipient very befitting recipient of that. So kindly, I know you cannot ignore me. Feel that loving claim with humility. It's not a forceful claim, humble claim, loving claim in relation to them. Rakshishatiti vishasho, goptritte baranang tata. Rakshishatiti vishasho means having that firm faith in the divine couple Mahaprabhu, they will be protecting me, kindly protecting me. And Goptritte Baranang Tatha will also be kindly na, taking care of me, affectionately taking care of me, no, nurturing me, mercifully, lovingly nurturing me to helping me to grow up in relation to uh, loving devotional relation with them, grow up. And then next, Rakshi Shatiti Vishasho Gaptritte Varanam Tatha. Atmanik Shepa Karpanne. With that mood and mood, hmm, try to have love surrender. Here, surrender means dedication. Unlike, totally opposite to army surrender. Okay? It's a, it's a irresistibly it's a surrender caused by irresistible love attraction, okay? It ecstatic love, love taste towards divine couple. That kind of surrender means dedication, whole self, holistic dedication, love dedication. Atmanik shepa means atmani vedanam. Atmanik shepa. So with that, feelings of loving claim and firm faith in their lordships, dedicate yourself. Try, at least try to be dedicating yourself with all love according to your capacity. With the insistence of feelings that you love Krishna, you love Simati Radharani. Okay, you feel it so then it will happen at some point realistically happen it's a yogi yogic process also devo devotional yogic process insistence is called cultivation process of cultivation holy insistence okay and do that love dedication okay make that love dedication which way never with false pride with humility Atmanik shepa karpanne, with humbleness, with all devotional humility, then you are able to actually offer your offer your love service with that with that high spirit of sharanaguti, with that high noble spirit most lofty and noble spirit of Sharanagati to attract Krishna. That's what attracts Krishna towards you. Atma Nikshepa, as Guru Mahaj says, never forget to become humble. Okay? Holy humility. Such humility never means that you became low. You became low or you became so feeble and low class and small. No, such humility makes you more glorious. Such 
quality of humility actually makes you higher, better, more glorious. Okay? In your spiritual life, in your life divine. Mm. So, that is a great wealth in our life, loving humility. Opposite to any type of false, false pride or vanity. That is called Saranagati. So Guru Mahaj laid a lot of stress on this Saranagati in life. He loved the songs of Thakur Bhaktivinod composed by Thakur Bhaktivinod Narottam Das Thakur around Saranagati. You know, songs composed by Bhaktivinod Thakur in his Saranagati, Kalyana Kalpotaru and other places, songs composed by Sri Narottam Das Thakur and other pure Acharyas devotees around Saranagati. Mm. He said, he, Guru Mahaj laid so much importance that Saranagati is the very basis, foundation in our life and also when it reaches to the highest degree, unlimited degree, it goes on, continued to be increasing and increasing to the unlimited degree. It also becomes our end. There is no end of having Saranagati. It just varies on different dimensions, on different degrees, but it's ever, ever unending, ever unending. And in this relation, Sri Guru Mahaj also explained. See, and the love in such Saranagati is, is not like any type of normal or mundane, any type of common normal mundane love. Guru Mahaj pointed out the mundane love is selfish. It is always conditioned by different types of selfishness. Okay? No matter what kind of love we find on this mundane plane, all are ultimately selfish. As soon as selfishness is disturbed, love also disturbed. Okay? It cannot be self-conditioned. It cannot be love for love's sake. Okay? It's all mundane love, all dependent, conditioned, very much conditioned okay, on different interests, individual interests. And here on this mundane plane, we think, we define love to be like based on enjoyment. If I enjoy, if I like, I am enjoying as the master, then I love it. But as soon as I don't enjoy, I don't like, then I hate it. I don't love it anymore. The Guru Mahaj pointed out, love for Krishna is not like that at all. It is simply transcendental. I repeat, it is simply and completely transcendental to such limited concept. Okay, limited conceptions of the love found on the mundane plane of existence. Okay, much beyond it. There it is love for loving Krishna. Okay, it is a divine love for divinely loving Krishna. And that love is characterized by devotion. Devotional quality. A love without devotion is not qualified to be offered to Krishna. Because then it becomes based on selfish enjoyment. Okay, because I enjoy as a in sense gratification, being the master, being the commander, being master. I am enjoyer. So being, being a master enjoyer, I am enjoying, so I love it. As soon as I don't enjoy, I don't love it. The love in Krishna conception is never like that. Other way around. It's all for Krishna's pleasure. All ultimately meant for Krishna's pleasure. Simati Radharani's pleasure, Mahaprabhu's pleasure. Okay? In relation to them, for the pleasure of our Guru Bhargava. That is called love with dedication. Therefore, it's called loving devotion. A devotional love. It's not kind of mundanely enjoyable love, but a devoted love. Okay? And there it becomes love divine. So that kind of ecstatic devotional love or ecstatic, love, ecstatic loving devotion for Krishna is bhakti. There is the actual bhakti, not the ordinary type of mundane love is called bhakti. No. Okay. 
I just relatively I have to stop. I understand for your next question. It's it's fantastic because you've you've almost answered the next question or you've started to answer the next question. So the next question, which is the final question for our podcast, um, is what is the okay. essence of bhakti? And why is it so why is it so beneficial as a spiritual practice? Okay. Again, before going into the discussion of that, that beautiful question, I want to, okay, please excuse me. I would like to continue a little more on this current mm. topics. So it was one of the best teachings of Sila Guru Maharaj. Another next, next best teaching, Guru Maharaj explained several times, very meaningful way. You know, we know Supreme God means Almighty, all powerful. But the conception of almightiness of Krishna, not in forcing power, not in the concept of his forceful or forcing power, but the power of his attraction caused by his, his beauty and ecstatic love power. I repeat, Guru Mahaj explained beautifully. Okay, this, these are all connected to Sri Guru Mahal's definitions of Krishna, the supreme reality, the beautiful. <laughs> the beautiful means, he means the most wonderful, most lovely also. Not only, it not only says sight beauty, beauty in the form of sight, but it also, Guru Mahal, when Guru Mahal says supreme reality, reality, the beautiful, this also covers not only eye beauties, Sight beauty, but ear beauty, sound beauty, fragrance beauty, smelling beauty, okay, touch beauty, uh, taste beauty, and also our feelings beauty. Our beauty of feelings, romantic, divinely romantic feelings beauty. So conception of that beauty, reality, the beautiful, that conception of that beautifulness actually all encompassing, including all these aspects of beauty together, even the beauty of Krishna's power, even the beauty of Krishna's almighty also included there, not just only sight beauty. So much to explain in relation, connection. Okay. It feels so beautiful even to be explaining them. So now back to the point. Guru Maharaj explained, you know, we know Krishna, the definition of Supreme God, in other words, Krishna means he is all-powerful, is omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowledgeable, and all-beautiful, blissful. Now, he explained, whereas the other aspects of the same Godhead, like on the Vaikuntha plane, Almightiness means mostly the power, the power of the power, okay, For, forcing power, okay, power of the force and everything being commanded. It, it is able to command all other powers, okay, it is such a supreme power. And supreme God means that that supremely powerful, he is that much supremely, infinitely powerful, he can command simply command all other aspects of the powers in this whole infinite universe, okay? In universal existence. Guru Mahal says, Krishna is also almighty. But in Krishna conception of Godhead, his almightiness is not, in other words, the best quality, okay? The best quality and the conception of his almightiness is not, in is not found in his forcing powerfulness, forcing power, but in the power of his beauty and loving attraction, flute play, okay, attraction created by divine flute songs, 
The taste of it is irresistible, cannot be resisted, very powerful. Not only flute song, his visual beauty, sound beauty, starch beauty, taste beauty, everything all around, holistically. You know, Krishna is supremely almighty because he's supremely powerful, not with forcing almightiness, forcing power, but with the power of his, with the attractive power, power of his attraction created through his unfathomable, unlimited beauty and taste, attractiveness, okay, ecstatic, ecstatic love feelings. When he wakes up within you to, to be connected, to be related, deeply, intimately related with him. Okay, that's how he is almighty. So the highest conception of Krishna's almightiness is not through forcing power but through the power of his own beauty, unlimited beauty and grace, okay, attractiveness and beauty of his qualities, most charming, irresistibly, irresistibly attractive qualities, various qualities. So on the plane of the, on the highest plane of perfection, Goloka Vrindavana, Guru Maharaj explains, Hardly, hardly anything is reigned there, ruled there by forcing power. As all are, all are naturally ruled by the power of Krishna's sweet will and nectarine beauty, fragrance, his charm, fragrance, beauty, most beautiful qualities, charming qualities, his graciousness. Okay, so on the highest plane of reality, in other words, on the highest plane of perfection, everything is ruled. In Krishna's Krishna Loka, Goloka, everything is ruled by the power of beauty, power of love, love attraction, okay, rather than forcing power. They have no function there. <laughs> One of the best explanations, teachings of Srila Guru Maharaj. Taking from the scriptures, Krishna means Akhila Rasha Amrita Murti, the supreme embodiment, unlimited embodiment or personification of all infinite rushes, anandam, ecstatic love, ecstatic love attraction, ecstatic, ecstatic love increasing beauty, ecstatic love creating beauty. Ecstatic love creating flute play, flute musics. Ecstatic love creating dancing. His dancing postures, his leela, very sweet nectarine <clears throat> pastimes. That is Krishna. So <clears throat> that is the <clears throat> highest conception of Krishna's almightiness. <sighs> See, one, I can explain, I can go on. There are many beautiful best teachings given by Guru Maharaj. Okay, I can stop. Rather I can relate to the next, relate to the next question. Please, you repeat your question. Uh, of course, Maharaj. Um, what is the essence es of bhakti? Mm, what mm. is the essence of bhakti? And why is it so beneficial as a spiritual practice? Like I have already explained uh, now, a few minutes ago. The way Srila Guru Maharaj Guru Bargo explains bhakti in a simple way. Bhakti means it's a deep attraction, deep heartfelt attraction, deep attachment. Deep attachment with deep attraction. Deep attraction with deep attachment. Now combined with loving devotion. That is bhakti. Okay? It is very difficult. Actually, it's very difficult to fully explain it 
through language, through limited words. Okay, because no matter how much I explain through words, still it remains beyond. So much remains beyond. So the real nature and character, taste of bhakti. But we can get some idea. So, fundamentally, okay, it's a deep attachment, deep attraction towards Krishna. And with the deep attachment and deep attraction, attractive attachment with deep attractions, feeling, awakening with loving devotion, ecstatic loving devotion to Krishna. That is bhakti. In a word, we know it is ecstatic, loving devotion, or devotional love, ecstatic devotional love. Okay, so here, herein, I'm actually explaining the bhakti in its complete conception rather than any type of like primary level of bhakti, then bhava, then, bhava, then prema. So when in this context, I am explaining the bhakti as prema also. Okay, bhava bhakti, prema bhakti, all included in this term bhakti. So, in other words, the conception of Krishna's prema, prema bhakti also included within this definition. So, also <clears throat> Guru Maharaj, Guru Bhargo beautifully explained that, look, it's a bhakti based on, means it is an ecstatic love, ecstatic loving devotion in relation to divine couple, which is fundamentally, I mean primarily and finally, all through, meant for their pleasure. To give them pleasure. Okay. Just as when when we love someone, we want to do something for our beloved. And we take pleasure. We also give pleasure to the beloved. And by because I love him or I love her. So in order to, in the process of doing something for my beloved, I also take so much pleasure. This is so much relational. Has to be understood realize in a relational way, then what to speak more of love of Krishna, ecstatic loving devotion of Krishna. Okay, so much more pleasurable. But the, like, when we are going to do something for my beloved, naturally, I want to do something the way my beloved likes. He loves this way. She loves this way. So I'm happy to do, to make you happy to please you, to, to make you love, okay, to please you, to make you happy. Not that I am going to impose my liking and force my way of liking on my beloved and trying to do something, some favor to him or her, say, you must like it. No, that's not real love. That's not real, okay, committed, how do you say, real love or dedicated love in relation to my beloved in a similar way, and much more, much more, more than that, okay? So, uh, this, this way, Holy Scriptures and Guru Bhargo explain that bhakti for Krishna means you must lovingly offer, you must offer your love service to divine couple, to Krishna, with situated in that mood, in that temperament, okay, in that mode, that you are doing it, you are offering your service to please them, not trying to impose your way of pleasure, your personal way of liking on them, but rather the way they will be pleased, okay, by accepting your service, love service. This is one of the main criteria of bhakti. Other criteria, when you are offering your love, love service to Krishna Radhika, you must do, must, must do that with devotion. 
again. It's not love without devotion. Because sometimes, often on the mundane plane, we find some love without much respect. It is considered a different kind of, there are different types of love. You know, mostly it is selfishly oriented, all are selfishly oriented, or some contract, contractual, okay, love relationship between two partners or other friends. Okay, I do this for you, you do this for me. I take care of you, in return, you take care of me. It's a, uh, it is a contract of giving and taking, giving and taking in certain ways. As soon as that contract gets disturbed, all love is gone. Okay, but the love, bhakti for Krishna is totally distinct, totally different, totally transcendental to such cheap class, ordinary class, concept of love, what we also sometimes often call as love. I love this, I love that, in ordinary common sense. That is not at all bhakti. It can be connected to bhakti, but that is that by itself, that kind of cheap class, selfish, ordinary type of love can never be defined as bhakti. Although it may remain connected to hmm, world of bhakti, to some in a, in a way, but love for Krishna, in other words, loving devotion or devotional love for Krishna, in other words, bhakti, meaning that it is a love which is full of reverence, great reverence or deep respect and respectful commitment means devotion, a devoted love or loving devotion, that is bhakti, okay? If there is love without devotion, without respect, that is not qualified to be offered to Krishna, okay? Because it just becomes some ordinary selfish type of love, selfishly oriented common class of love based on one's own selfish likings, okay? So it changes, that love is gone when liking is gone. The love also gone. There is no commitment, no devotional commitment there. So that is not bhakti at all. Okay, it's a devotional love. So there's so much respect, reverence there. But on certain higher stage, certain higher stage of that reverence and respect, it even goes that ecstatic. Loving devotion towards Krishna Radhika goes beyond reverence. It becomes simply pure, heartfelt, ecstatic love, intimate love for divine couple, Mahaprabhu. Okay, without depending on reverence, because the training period already over through Vidhi Bhakti Sadhana. After that training period, after that training period over. Then as we enter into the world of Ragomargo Bhajana, on Ragomargo Bhajana, Prema Bhajana, then it can become spontaneously loving devotion. Okay, in relation to Krishna Radhika. Okay. And so, and in that love, again, holy scriptures explain. Okay, Klesogni in Bhakti Rasa Amrita Sindhu. Sri Rupa Goswami Prabhu beautifully explains, giving some definitions of, giving some beautiful definitions, wonderful definitions of what is bhakti. What is bhakti? I remember. Okay, those verses are first symptom, the symptoms of bhakti, pure bhakti, pure devotion being described. Klesagni, Subhada. I repeat, Klesa Agni, Subhadha, Moksha Laghuta Akrit, then Sandra Ananda Vishesh Atma, Sri Krishna Karshini Chasha. See, these are the signs of pure devotional love for Krishna. Means bhakti for Krishna. Klesa Agni, with the awakenment, simply with the little awakenment of that love divine for Krishna, transcendental love of Krishna, hmm. that 
the misery, the distress of life is gone. The feelings of distress of life takes leave. Okay. It becomes, it, at least it starts going away. Klesogni, Shuhada, and it brings, one can feel, it brings so much auspiciousness. It brings so much good, higher good in your life. You can taste them, realize them. Shuhada brings so much good to you, you can feel, realize. Moksha Lohutakrit, it brings so much good higher taste, attractive taste in your life, that even you feel like okay, neglecting the liberation, the kind of general type of liberation without the ecstatic taste of ecstatic love of Krishna. There are you know, four kinds of liberation described in scripture. Sarupo, Samipo, Shasti, Sajujo. Okay. So, Sarupo, Samipo, Shasti, Sajujo, yes. So, devotees lose taste or even achieving those kinds of liberation because liberation is mere liberation to them, not more than that. Now they are receiving a taste, ecstatic taste, nectarian taste, much higher than that. Okay. So, Moksha Laghuta Akrit. So, such taste, with the awakenment of such nectarian taste of bhakti, all the taste for liberation, okay, desire for liberation becomes so cheap class, so, how to say, distasteful. Moksha mm. Laghuta Akrit, the next line, Shandra Nanda Vishesh Atma, Sri Krishna Karashini Chasha. That devotee, that fortunate devotee of Radhika Krishna, I repeat, that most fortunate devotee of Radharani and Krishna, divine couple, now begin to feel intense Sandra. Sandra means condensed, condensed, ecstatic taste, blissful taste in their love dedication in love service to them. See, Sandrananda Vishesha Atma, that soul, that Jivo soul, then becomes filled with, inundated with, the condensed, ecstatic love feelings for divine couple and engages in that ecstatic love service to them, continues to be tasting and tasting and becoming divinely mad overwhelmed by that taste to the infinite without seeing any end, without any limit to that. That is Krishna Prema. That is the Krishna Prema of Krishna Prema Bhakti Simon Mahaprabhu presented to us mercifully out of so much mercy. Okay, very benevolently, mercifully, he presented that matchless gift, unparalleled, priceless gift in our life. Sandra Ananda Vishesh Atma Sri Krishna Kurshini Chasha and the power of that state of ecstatic the power of that ecstatic taste and ecstatic love of divine couple is so powerful it cannot but attract Krishna close to that devotee. It irresistibly attracts Krishna Krishna cannot stay away from that power you know, of that ecstatic love for him, that bhakti. Okay, see Krishna Krishni Chasha. It irresistibly attracts Krishna towards him by the power of his ecstatic loving devotion of that quality, of that quality, pure quality. Another Definition. See, I already told you, I will take time. See, such answers take time. Even to make it relatively complete, mm. Mm. Cannot, cannot make it, cannot complete it in absolutely, absolute way. Cannot, it, that's impossible to complete it in absolute way, a relatively complete way. So, 
नेक्स्ट वर्स पन्नाभा पन्नाभिलाषिता शून्यम ज्ञान कर्म धना वृतम आनुकूल कृष्णाशील कृष्णाशील मुक्ति I repeat, it also feels, it also feels so tasteful, so joyful, feels so joyful to repeat this such type of verses again and again. Simply feels so pleasurable to repeat. Anna bhila shita shunnam, gyan karma dana abritam, anukulle no Krishna anushilanam. Nama Bhakti Ruttama, second definition of about the intrinsic nature, real nature of Bhakti, in other words, essence of Bhakti. And the third verse, Sarvopadhi Vinir Muktam, Tat Parat Tena Nir Malam, Rishi Kena Rishi Kesa, Sevanam Bhakti Ruttchate. If I go into the explanation of both the verses, I may take another hour. So should I go on or you can find it out? The explanation, they, they are also be they are beautifully explaining about the intrinsic nature, real nature, fundamental nature, or essential nature of the bhakti. Okay, unna bhila shita shunnam gyano karma dhana abhitam anukulleno krishna anushilanam bhakti ruttama, uttama bhakti. And then Sarvopadhi Vinir Muktam Tatparatteno Nirmalam, another verse. So better you may find out the translation and add. Mm. Okay. Could you maybe now answer the, the or give some insight into the second half of the question in terms of why is why is bhakti so beneficial as a spiritual practice? Why should people in the everyday world mm. Practice very good question. Bhakti. Mm, very good question. One, one of the top, one of the top most beneficial questions, I would say, okay, for all the people and also the devotees. Mm, see, our Lord Krishna spoke about karma, about jnana about the path of yoga. Then finally he spoke about the path of bhakti, world of bhakti. It's like that. Sometimes we say good, better, best. So here Lord Krishna, not in three, by three steps, by two, through several steps, he culminated. Finally he culminated the truth for our highest interest Okay, into bhakti. So Guru Maharaj beautifully explained all the necessity of karma found its liberation in acquiring the divine knowledge, wisdom. All the necessity of divine knowledge and wisdom finds its liberation, means fulfillment. Here, liberation mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. fulfillment. Okay, in bhakti. Karmer Mukti Gane, Ganer Mukti Preme. I repeat, all the utility, all the best utility and best necessity of all our karma activities of our life finds its natural liberation, means its completion, its fulfillment in Ganam, divine wisdom, all pervading divine wisdom or knowledge. And all the divine, the whole world, infinite world of divine wisdom or knowledge, finds its liberation, means its fulfillment in bhakti, ecstatic love of God. Because without the taste of happiness, without the taste of real happiness, transcendental happiness, transcendental ecstasy and bliss, our life remains incomplete, no matter how much activist we become, how great activist we become, how great Gani, how great knowledgeable person, wise person we become, taking having so much intellectual knowledge, no matter how great yogi we become, but as long as we are not having, receiving the great taste, incomparable, priceless taste 
of this ecstatic love of okay ecstatic love of god ecstatic love of krishna ecstatic loving devotion of krishna everything remains incomplete and lacking with their lacking because ananda brahmanu vidya supreme lord has been defined in one of the aspects not one of the i repeat it the best by by one of the best definitions the supreme god supreme lord has been defined to be anandam himself ultimately rasa raso boi sa rasam jhevayam labdhanandi bhavati i am quoting from the vedic scriptures om raso boi sa rasam jhevayam labdhanandi bhavati okay then ananda brahmano vidyan na vivedikutaschana then satchid ananda vigraha okay ananda is the topmost definition of the supreme absolute truth supremely supremely divine absolute truth means krishna okay so ultimately okay although he is full of power full of knowledge he is the embodiment of infinite power infinite wisdom infinite knowledge not but ultimately or infinitely yogic power but ultimately he is actually the embodiment or personification of infinite bliss and ecstasy and that is the highest definition highest beautiful definition of the supreme god supreme lord krishna so naturally and that is our highest target that is our highest target highest aim and aims and objective of our life to receive the highest happiness highest pleasure highest bliss and ecstasy ecstasy divine in our life specifically in relation to that ecstasy cannot come from the limited material world that's why that ecstasy has to be in relation to the infinite source of all transcendental ecstasy bliss krishna who is none other than krishna therefore until and unless we receive the, that taste okay that taste that treasure matchless priceless treasure invaluable treasure invaluable ambrosial treasure in our life our life remains very much unfulfilled unfulfilled now back to the point of further analytical explanation see one can be a big karmi karmi means big activist like big social worker big activist okay engaging in so many activities and all these but in order to be doing that at some point he has to find some satisfaction in that otherwise he cannot be continuing that activity for a long time okay for the social welfare work or other things in our life so has to find some taste in that job some satisfaction in that job what he is doing activity so here also it finally indicates all the you know some results of the activities although the people are doing in with the sense of or oh, it ought to be done with the sense of duty duty for duty sake sometimes some nice people nice people engage in activities that they may not find much satisfaction or happiness from that but they simply go on doing it on the moral grounds okay that it ought to be done whether i feel satisfied with it happy with it or not but it ought to be done it's my duty uh, uh, to do this for others but at some point when that even all those activities also become relatively fulfilled when one receives some happiness some satisfaction from that just don't go on just simply dry away they find some satisfaction whether animal lovers 
or human lovers, they find some happiness, some satisfaction in order to help others, doing good things for others. So it is no, no more dry for them. See, it is connecting to aspect of the pleasure, ultimately, mm. ananda, pleasure, happiness, satisfaction. Now, from after karma, level of karma, when we come up to the level of jnanam, or beside, side by side, side by side of the karma yoga, when we come to the jnana yoga level, okay, that all activities must be done with the lights of knowledge. If we do not have the proper lights of wisdom or knowledge, we do not even know what is good or what is bad, what activity should be done, what activity will be beneficial and what will be harmful. We do not even know, do not have any ability to judge, to make proper judgments between right and wrong, okay, good and bad. What, what will be good, what will be harmful. So therefore, Lord Krishna says, lights of knowledge, of proper understanding about what is what, is very essential. Okay, you cannot just be activist without the lights of knowledge. Okay, without the illumination of higher wisdom, then your activities can go on in a wrong way. And it can, it, in, instead of instead of doing good, it can bring bad. Instead of doing good things, bringing good, it can be causing harm to others because you do not have the capacity of judging what is right activity, what is wrong. What is wrong doing, the right doing. Therefore, in order to in order to engage in the karma proper way, okay, you must have lights of knowledge. In other words, it must be guided, guided by the lights of knowledge and wisdom. So do all your activities accompanied by lights of knowledge and wisdom. Okay, Then you know which is good and which is bad. What kind of activities truly beneficial for all and which are wrong, unbeneficial, non-beneficial, bad for others. So all our karma activities must be guided by superior knowledge, intelligence, or wisdom. <laughs> now, next it is explained. Yoga should also come besides karma and jnanam. Now, through meditation, the higher part of wisdom is called realization. And that realization comes not through intellectual knowledge, not through merely dry kind of mathematical intellectual knowledge, but it comes through feelings, through realization, experience. There comes meditation. Alongside some external physical yogic stretches, there comes the functioning of higher meditation that you understand your knowledge, whatever things you have in your knowledge, okay, through, through your intellectual ability, understand them through feelings, through meditation, through feelings, through meditation, okay, beyond just some dry kind of dry calculative intellectual knowledge, okay, intellectual type of knowledge. Because real knowledge and wisdom is much living. It's a living thing, okay, much beyond just only dry mathematical, okay, mecha how do you say, mechanical, mechanical intellectual knowledge. So that knowledge or wisdom comes through meditation world of meditation, to direct feeling into the world of that knowledge you have, okay, or wisdom. Yoga comes, and then finally Lord Krishna, okay, pointed out, final culmination to the bhakti, that you have all these, you are a great karmi, you are a great karmi, great gani, great yogi, Yet, you are not feeling fulfilled. Yet, yet you find so much is lacking in you. 
you are lacking in happiness. You are deriving some satisfactions, no doubt. You have been deriving some, some sort of satisfactions or happiness from the level of your karma, jnana, or yoga, but it's not yet fulfilled type of happiness. Not yet fulfilled happiness, fulfilled, full-fledged world of pleasure and ecstasy. You have not achieved the taste yet. Now come to that. Come up to that level. <coughs> and that is my abode. My abode, my loka. Okay, that is my connection. Come, come up. Connect with me, relate to me. To ecstatic love. Then all become so fulfilled in that ultimate ecstatic, in ultimate that ecstatic love of myself, means of God. Okay? Ecstatic loving devotion. Uh, devotional love. Then everything gets fulfilled. That is called the highest fulfillment a summum bonum of life, of life, highest attainment of life, uh, in ecstatic, in the feelings and realizations, divine experience, divine most experience of the ecstatic love of God, love service to God. So therefore, until and unless we receive that transcendental taste of the ecstatic love of God. Okay. Everything remains unfulfilled in our life. Our life can never be complete or completely fulfilled so because that is the ultimate, highest and all-encompassing, all-comprehending, co all-encompassing, all, how do you say, all fulfilling supreme object of our life. Okay. Treasure, nectary treasure of our life. Uh, divine ecstatic love of God, getting the taste. Then we are fulfilled. Therefore, having a bhakti is so much beneficial, ultimately beneficial, mm. finally, and Beneficial in full-fledged sense, holistically beneficial. Without that, we can never receive complete benefit. All other benefits remain futile. All other temporary benefits remain unfulfilled. Okay, with little bit of satisfaction and happiness compared to the ambrosial, infinite, unending satisfaction and pleasure fulfillment we can have in love with Krishna, ecstatic love of Krishna Radhika. <coughs> Therefore, it is supremely beneficial. Wow. Thank you, Maharaj, for that explanation. Um, it was it was wonderful. And um, I, I certainly knew before we, we recorded this podcast that you wanted to be given the opportunity to give some thorough answers uh, to the questions. Um, and I think we've done that. We've done that very well. It, I really appreciated how during this podcast interview, you've really answered a lot of the questions quite thoroughly. Um, and I really appreciated that. Um, believe it or not, we've been talking for almost three hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. To, just, to, just flown away like anything. It's gone very quick. Um, this is one of my longer podcasts. Um, I think what I'm going to do now, Maharaj, is is say goodbye to the viewers at home. And then you and I can have a brief discussion after. But um, it's really been wonderful to have you as a guest on this week's podcast. Um, and and I've really appreciated the detail that you've gone into when talking about a range of issues from the discourses of Shuddha Shuddha Maharaj and Shuddha Prabhupada to the essence of Bhakti and what Bhakti is and how it's beneficial to our lives as ordinary everyday people. 
Um, and you know what? During this podcast, I've been watching behind you and I've seen that the sun has set through the window. When we started this podcast, the sun was shining outside. And now I can see yes. that it's the evening now in India. <laughs> right. The Aroti also going on. I can hear it. The it's evening, wonderful. Aroti. Yes. It's wonderful. On, no. And it mm -hmm. just it, it's nice to feel that 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 living temple experience. That, that, that everything in the temple is carrying on as normal, uh, which is wonderful. It has also been a very pleasing experience for me, okay, to be spending time with you in this way. I appreciate, truly appreciate your valuable service, okay, in the, in the field of preaching in this way, okay. I appreciate my loving pronoun to your good self, and also to all the viewers, all the audience connecting to this evening. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. So I'm going to just briefly say goodbye to the viewers at home, and then you, okay. you and I can have a, a, a little debrief after. So okay. a big thank you to His Holiness Bhakti Nandan Swami Maharaj for being our guest on this 102nd uh, episode of the Hare Krishna Project podcast. A uh, huge thank you to everyone for tuning in. Don't forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, to hit the subscribe button so you're kept updated about future podcasts. And also, if you're watching this on Facebook, please do like or follow the Hare Krishna Project Facebook page so you're kept updated about future podcasts as well. So until next week, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.